Uh, you're an expert nutrition doctor. Can you talk about sugar's role in cancer? Cancer is an obligate glucose metabolizer, which means cancer is a sugar feeder. And so this has been known for about 70 years. Uh, Otto Warburg won a Nobel Prize. Uh, he was an MD, PhD in Europe who found that clearly cancer cells are fermentative. They mm -hmm. prefer burning sugar, glucose, uh, and they have roughly four to ten times the number of glucose receptors on their cell membranes. Therefore, what we find is diabetics, because they have elevated blood glucose, have a higher incidence of cancer. Uh, elevated intake of white sugar, elevated blood glucose levels, even if you're not diabetic, increases the risk for cancer. Animal studies have been shown where they give the animals a diet that will induce low or normal or high levels of blood glucose with cancer, and they find it's a dose-dependent response. If you can lower blood glucose, the animals stay alive longer. So sugar and cancer are definitely linked in. The PET scan, positron emission tomography, it's a multi-million dollar hospital implement in which they inject radioactively labeled glucose into the cancer patient's veins. And then they use a Geiger counter-like device to track where the sugar went because that's where the cancer is because cancer is a sugar feeder. And then they walk away from this procedure and say, eat whatever you want. That doesn't make any sense at all. Mm. Cancer is a sugar feeder, and we can use that as one of the tools to help beat cancer. For instance, intravenous vitamin C. Uh, ascorbic acid, or vitamin C, and glucose are nearly identical in, in the molecular structure, and so cells share receptor sites for vitamin C and, and uh, glucose. So when the cancer cell thinks it's sucking in glucose, it's taking in intravenous vitamin C, which can then become a prooxidant, uh, cause hydrogen peroxide. Uh, cancer cells do not have an enzyme that allows that to be neutralized. And essentially, you can give a selective anti-neoplastic agent, intravenous vitamin C, that does zero harm and can help many cancer patients. Uh, so the big question would be, why isn't that used more often? Why don't we hear more about that? What we have is time delays, time lags. Uh, for instance, around 1860, uh, Ignaz Simmelweis was a physician in Vienna, Austria. And at that time, puerperal fever or maternal fever was up to 90% of all mothers. So what would happen is, doctor delivers a horse in a stable wipes his hands off and goes in and delivers a baby in the hospital bed, doesn't wash his hands thoroughly. Well, you, of course, you have fecal contamination and all mm -hmm. that. The incidence of fever and death in delivering a baby in a hospital was very high. Dr. Semmelweis said, what if we wash our hands? So he wash your hands in a dilute solution of chlorine, which is a very good uh, cleanser, and he found he could reduce purpural fever to almost zero. And his colleagues, now let, think about this, it costs nothing, there were zero side effects, no toxicity, mm -hmm. but he couldn't explain why it happened. And his colleagues said, well, what are we to expect is this coming from, Dr. Simmelweis? Is it spooks? And they laughed him out of the medical profession. And about two or three decades later, uh, Louis Pasteur came forth and said, we have found Dr. Simmelweis's spooks. And so there's a time lag going on right now. We know this stuff works. We just can't get people to use it yet, but it will come.